And Stevie, we are on Discussing Facebook. Securities. Yeah. And word on the street is that we got a couple different rates of springs around here, Steve. We Spring do. rates. Boxes. They got all these crazy numbers on them. I really don't know how we pair them up with everything. That might be something that you could explain to everyone. If it was up to me, I would just, you know, go in the boxes, go crazy. Chase. Chase. Anyways, uh, today we're going to be talking about how we <coughs> change our spring rates due to either driver weight differences, accessory differences, said not, so on and nope. so forth. But in order to do that, we have to go over to Justin Smith. <coughs> it's not just Justin. I'm going to change again? it up for the next 25 videos. I like, I I like you changing it up, honestly. Listen. But uh, Mitch is not on Instagram there, sir. Hold on. So Chase, would it's, you please do your job coming. before we start discussing wow. it? It's coming. Is, Mitch, you got me? Is zooming in on I me gonna you. help Instagram? It does. Oh wow, there you go. It's, Good it's job, focus. Chase. You're my focus, me. Justin. You keep me in focus. <laughs> the other day, uh, thank you very much for I that, Steve. I appreciate that. But uh, the one thing that you guys did over there was show a few springs on the shelf. I heard just the, a few. Just a few. So uh, I heard heard somewhere a rumor somewhere that we only have one spring kit fits all for everybody, and uh, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Whoever said that is an absolute idiot. Ooh, um, and, and and whoever said that, then you come on over here and we can discuss how big of an idiot you are, because there's 80 pallets of spring rates inside this shop, and those are just what we flip in one week. There is another building just on the other side of this street that has 380 pallets of springs in it, and that's what feeds this section, all of which different rates, all of which to specifically give you a spring kit for your car, for your driving style, specifically, all, uh, lots of specifically, but especially uh, for the weight of your vehicle. It's very important that we get that right. Now, it's also very hard to do, and springs are adjustable, preloads and things like that, for a reason, because every car is different, every UTV is different. It's very specific. It's extremely specific. Yeah, so what we should do maybe for Can this... Can you be uh, more specific? For uh, this uh, Tech Tuesday, let's make this a drinking game. Every time I say specific, <laughs> take a shot. I guarantee you that uh, you guys will specifically be drunk <laughs> by the end of this one, for sure. But if you guys have spring questions specifically about springs, then um, please hit us up. We've got Mitch. We've got Steve on here, and they can answer questions be as... Be specific. Be very specific about your question, and we will be very specific about the answer. So, before we go into how we change spring kits for each person's needs, I'm going to go into a little bit of the basics about this. And we've done this before on how dual rate spring kit works, so I'm going to kind of bang through some of the easy stuff fast. And it may not be easy, but it's the basics. Spring kit tuning. You've got spring rates. Springs are, are uh, rated or um, uh, listed in different spring rates. So if you take a coil spring and you compress it one inch and it gives you 200 pounds of force, that's a 200 pound spring, 200 pound spring rate. If it compresses two inches, that's 200 pounds per inch. 400 pounds is what you're gonna feel if you physically could do that. Um, the way that you would calculate spring rates when it comes to a combined or dual rate spring kit, if you run a single spring that is 400 pounds, then you have a 400 pound spring rate. Let's just say that you took a 400 pound spring and you put it over a 500, which could be a lot of dual rate spring kits on trophy trucks or on class ones or class tens. The formula is top spring, times or multiplied by the bottom spring divided by top plus bottom and chase loves bottoms so top spring it's times true. bottom spring divided by top plus bottom i'm going to simplify that for you a 400 pound spring over a 500 is a 222 pound combined spring rate and then once you compress the system far enough to get into a crossover ring which is the only way you're going to create a dual rate spring kit accurately. You will eliminate the combined spring rate and get into just the bottom spring, which is a 500 pound spring. Bottom pound, bottom spring, 500. 222 pound combined to 500. Let's just change that. 500 over 500. This is a common question that we get. 
hey man, how could my spring kit be dual rate when you sent me two of the same spring? Say a 500 over 500 or a 4 over 4. The poundage does not matter with this discussion. These are not the rates that we use. I'm just using arbitrary numbers. Specifically, <laughs> <coughs> take a shot. Would, uh, what would your specific shot be? Mitch, let's ask, uh, uh, tequila. White Claw. <laughs> You're so gay. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, what's your shot? It's not gonna be tequila, mm. but, it's, uh, but man, that Captain Morgan killed me, so I don't know, man, probably, probably vodka. You're up in the air except for vodka yeah, right no, now? I, for real, Jameson. Oh, oh yeah, okay, Jameson you're just shot. kidding. Yeah, no, yeah. White Claw, for, Fireball. No, that, that's, yeah. Just All right, hey Josh, since you never say anything behind <laughs> the camera, let's make you embarrassed. What's your shot of choice? No shot. Espresso no. shot. <laughs> <laughs> that, is true. that is because Josh is sober. Yay, Josh. He's the only <laughs> smart one on this feed. So wait, wait, wait! You didn't ask me about my shot, Justin. Nobody Chase, cares. nobody cares. I, I like lemon drops. So that's okay. <laughs> Let's be specific. Nobody gives a shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So a 500 over 500. Yes, you can run the same rate spring top and bottom, and it will be dual rate. The reason is, if you do the math. Top spring times bottom divided by top, uh, top plus bottom, you're gonna get a 250 pound spring rate combined and then jump into a 500 pound spring when it's just the lower. Let's go to another uh, misnomer that people actually hit us up with a lot. How can you run a heavier upper, and doesn't that defeat the purpose in a dual rate spring kit? Well, no. If you run a heavier upper over a lighter lower, here's the math. It's a 275, or sorry, 272 combined pound spring rate going into a 500 pound lower. So look at all of these. As you start changing upper springs, you get a fairly consistent and um, understandable spring rate jump on the combined upper and lower. This is very tunable. If you start changing lowers, then what happens then is you get into a situation where it's such a drastic change from say 500 pounds to 550 or 500 pounds to 600 that the shock in a UTV situation where it's only one shock per corner can't control the added rebound needed to control that extra spring rate. So imagine it going plushly through a combined rate. Chase loves it when I start doing this stuff right here. But it's plush through the combined then it gets into a stiff lower you want that stiff lower to stop you from bottoming out the car. But that stiff lower is gonna shoot that system apart in a rebound direction much faster as well. So it's hard to control that added rebound need without multiple zone shocks or an external bypass like a trophy truck or two shocks. Steve. Justin, there's been quite a few questions. I'm gonna sum it up into one on this exact yes. subject. When should they change the rate? Like how much weight can you put on a car before you have to start changing rates? I'm going to let you take it. I mean, it all just depends. I mean, uh, 50 to 100 pounds would probably change the rate if you're going to add mm, a cage, if you're going to add... In spring, Steve, I'm going to stop you there. So yeah. that's true in like spring rate. We're going to change them 50 to 100 pounds each. Correct. But typically, oh, we're going to have a range in the vehicle of probably 2 to 250 pounds <laughs> total or 100 to 150 pounds per end of the UTV before we're changing rates. Correct, the rate would only, be, that's right. So, gonna... right, so I'm just trying to be really specific hmm. in everything that we're talking about because a lot of people try to call us on this kind of stuff and you know, they're not taking into consideration there's a lot of variables. So if the front of a UTV is 100 to 150 pounds heavier than the previous one we just did, we're gonna change spring rates for that. If the rear of it is 100 to 150 pounds heavier than the previous one we just did, say uh, heavier tool kit, way more beer in the cooler, uh, spare tire or no spare tire, I mean it's a 50 pound change and usually we would change rates for that because it's so far on the back of the car or on the back of the UTV and leverage comes into consideration with that. We're going to change rates for that. Um, what are some of the other things that you would change rates for, Steve? I'm going to put you. I'm going to ask you the question instead I mean, of on the feed. Cages, depending on how the cage is incorporated, if it's got a built-in bumper, weight-wise. Um, 
Riding style. Riding style could be a consideration on that side of things. Location of weight. And I don't mean front to rear. So if you have a spare tire, so but it's yeah, on the, the roof. the tire's hanging off the rear. Yes. That's going to be completely different than when it's sitting right up here on the top. Yep, because it's leverage. Correct. Yes, the whole, you just gain the same amount of weight, but you put it in a different spot. And that extra leverage off the rear bumper is going to require a rear spring a lot quicker than one where the tires in the bed are on the roof. Correct. So we consider all of that kind of stuff. How do we figure that stuff out, Mitch? Um, how would we ever know when to change the spring rates depending on where you put a tire? You see how that, like, they, like, shifted all towards me? Like, yeah, like, both cameras like, are on you. Are you nervous? No, I was filming this morning. So okay, we're cool. Good to go. So um, how do we know that? There's a ton of testing, and there, there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. I mean, you're, you're ride hiding it, you're driving it, you're testing it, you come back from a test, you change something, you go drive it again, you feel the difference on that. Um, a ton of time and a ton of spring changing, a, a ton of math, like Justin was saying, on combined rates and trying to figure out the perfect setup for, let's say, the guy's riding desert or he's riding dunes, whatever it might be. We are specifically spending that amount of time to get that set up for that riding style, if you will. So that makes sense? put it very short and blunt, we test every single day for a reason. Yeah, 100%. Um, a lot of people will say like, oh, where's your shock dyno or whatever. It's, mm -hmm. it's right here. I mean, we're literally driving cars all the time and figuring out the best situation for each each car. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little bit further on the weight thing that you're talking about in the testing. So a lot of, of car customers ask us, hey, can we just send you the four corner weights and you're going to nail the spring kit? Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Um, but we actually prefer to see or hear where all your accessories are or hear what accessories you have on the, on the UTV. And we love to see a picture of yours because if you say you have a spare tire and don't tell us it's hanging off the rear bumper, that vehicle is going to weigh the same as the next guy that has a spare tire on it. But you've got extra leverage with it hanging off the bumper. So we're going to make a, a design of spring kit that's different for your UTV with a tire in the wrong or a different place than somebody else with a tire in a completely separate location, right? Sure. Um, so we're very specific about where all these things are. And sometimes four corner weights can't tell us that where the leverage is. So a lot of times we're like, yeah, don't, don't bother. Just give us a list of where everything's at. And that's the reason for why we do that. Well, it's also like when you fill out the whole, you know, <clears throat> paragraph of all of your weights and accessories and stuff like that. That stuff goes into that. It's not just a, here's your spring kit. Like, we actually accomplish What paragraph that. are you talking about, Mitch? Like, let's say you let's go on say, the website, you order a spring kit from us, or call on the, I don't know, are we doing the phone stuff anymore, but more um, website than anything. Yeah. You fill out literally each individual thing of your driver weight, your passenger weight, your, your rear cooler, toolbox, spare tire, location, all that stuff. That goes into what we send you guys for your spring kit. So. Hey Mitch, can you be specific on that website that they can visit? <laughs> Actually, you can. www.shocktherapist.com. <laughs> Paul Rubicon, I'm already two huh. shots in and Diesel Dog wants to know, mm -hmm. if I'm not mm -hmm. drunk, do I get a free spring kit? <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. <laughs> so, yeah, no. <laughs> I did have a good question from Brody J. Cook. Uh, just bought your spring kit for a 2018 four-seat turbo XP. The front feels stiff. Any suggestions? Um, my first thing would be checking your ride heights, making sure that those are in the correct location or measurements that we're looking yes, for. Yes, and with the driver in the, in the vehicle, in the car, that's a you, common mistake. You don't do that, and then you're yep. going to set it up too high. If you put a passenger on the sheet when you filled it out, make sure that passenger's in there as well. Um, your adjusters, too. Make sure your adjusters are on the softest setting to start with, and then your crossover location, too. If all that stuff's in check, then we can, we can talk more and, and figure out what's going on. It's uh, extremely rare for one of our spring kits to be stiffer feeling than stock. So for you to say that, it usually is telling us that some of those adjustments have not been made or followed, and we can walk you through that very easily and fix it. Jay Hupps, whether Steve dances on the car <laughs> affects spring rates. <laughs> uh, you got a point. Depends on what type of dance I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. It's a specific dance and it depends on the song. We would tune the spring kit according to that dance, right? Correct. Street? Yeah. Exactly. He's got a very good point. Back to the board. My, what I'm trying to uh, show you guys is that it does not matter whether you have the same spring top or bottom or a heavier spring top or bottom. The rates are all mathematically able to be figured out and it's a linear thing that you can tune from. Back over to here. So if you have, uh, we've got rates, we've got the math for the rates, we've got preload. Preload is your adjustable way of making it so that one spring kit can adjust for 200 pounds of swing and weight 
on a, on a UTV. So if you give us all your accessories and you're 100 pounds different than your friend, we might be able to send you the same spring kit rate wise and you've got a little bit more preload than your buddy does to account for the weight. That is part of the adjustability. If you've you know, surpassed the adjustability of the spring kit, say 250 pounds, then we should have and usually will send you a stiffer spring kit. Typically a stiffer upper spring first. Valving. Once, I'm sorry, preloads are your adjustability, whether you got a more preload or less preload. Height, when I say height, that is the length of the spring. Uh, length of spring makes no difference in ride heights and ride quality. The only thing length of spring does is packaging. Whether the spring is packaged on a shock in a short way and the preload nut is lower on the shock body or it's a taller system and the preload nut is higher on the shock body. Packaging on a shock, depends on how many threads are on it and depending on the year some have more or less we don't want to run out of adjustability also we want to make sure you have a little bit of room on top so you can uh, adjust it a little bit softer if you're a little bit lighter on UTV um, also you've got coil bind if you run a spring that's too short and you're compressing it too far you can bind all those springs together that's bad and usually breaks springs and that's why you see an upper spring on factory UTVs have a lot of breakage. Or some spring kits that are sold on the market where they're really short upper and it's bound all the time, typically that spring's going to break because it can't, uh, it can't function and twist correctly if all the springs are touching each other. One way you know if that's happening is if the powder coat in between all the springs is broken where the springs would touch each other, they're rubbed then you know you've got spring bind and you got an issue. It needs to be a longer spring or a stiffer spring to fix that. Anything else? A uh, ton of questions on the valving specifically to our spring rate. So now okay. that's the next subject. So, so. Let, me, let me jump into that. Height means nothing other than where the preload collar is, unless you're dealing with uh, bind. Valving compensates for rate. What I mean by that is if you run a, a light spring rate, a very soft spring package, then you need to have the internals of the shock compensate for that by being stiffer. If you run a really stiff or heavy spring rated spring package, then the shock should be compensated for that spring package by having a lighter valving package. So some of the things you're going to see if you go too, too far both directions. If you run a really light spring kit and too much valving, you'll have overheating, you'll have uh, typically can be very stiff as it transitions through travel from the plush zone into the bump zone. It's going to be really aggressive and hurt. If you run a spring kit that's way too stiff and not enough valving in the shock, it tends to be boaty and it doesn't control uh, enough of the movements when you go through whoops and it stacks up and starts to get out of control over and over and over again. Um, also, if the spring kit is too stiff, um, which we have seen a lot of people run spring kits that are five, six, seven hundred pound spring rates on a UTV, which is just ludicrous. You don't have enough rebound valving inside most shocks to control it. You can't, even if you choke the piston down and slow down the flows, you can't control rebound. So, because the spring wants to shoot out too fast. So there's a lot of areas where the range goes too far and you see a shock that's going to have to be overvalved and overheat or a shock that's undervalved and could cavitate internally. It's a whole other subject and nitrogen pressures affect that. We're not going to get into it because that's a whole other hour. But Steve, you had a question. Two questions. One, uh, will <clears throat> forward arms and lift kits make a difference when it comes to a spring kit? Uh, yeah, so a, a lot of times a forward, a forward wheelbase or an arm system that moves the tire forward um, we'll also relocate the shock and it can change the spring kit or it will change what we need for preloads and rates. And then you said lift kits. Lift so, kits we temp typically temp Yeah, take typically off. lift kits we're going to pull off and we're going to do the right spring. The reason is the only thing a lift kit is is a spacer on top of the spring to give you more preload. It's more spring tension is all it's giving you. Um, typically it's going to ride rough, it's going to raise it and get you what you want for a lift, but it's going to ride like crap. So we would prefer to package a spring kit to give you the ride height that you want and still have it plush, which can be done as long as you figure the math. And a lot of people don't use the math. Just saying. I know some people in here that are not very good at math. Chase. Like Chase, when I say be on time, and I he's say, like, what's time? It's like time, 
Time has numbers in it, and he has no idea what those are. No. Uh, one more question, mm. Justin. Because we have a one-size-fits-all spring kit, why don't we just <laughs> tell everyone our spring rates? <laughs> so uh, we're never going to give out spring rates. It's secret sauce. It's like giving out your, your recipe to whatever you're cooking at a five-star restaurant and let everybody else do it. We also spend a ton of time testing and, and perfecting what we have. It's, we're not going to give that out. Um, you guys, if you want, to, you want to figure out your own spring kits, then go out and do all the testing you want for the next two years and figure out your spring kit. Or you can just buy it from somebody that tests all day long and get you real close or perfect. It seems a lot easier to me. That's a, that's a question on here too from Bryce. What's the difference from your DRS versus other companies such as Eibach slash GeForce? Uh, so, I mean, GeForce drastic, completely different mentality with what they sell. Eibach is similar to us, but we run different rates. And the reason is, that you know, Eibach is throwing a spring kit on something just trying to make the spring kit work. No, nothing against them, they're a great company and they build good stuff. But you know, we're throwing spring kits on things knowing that we're gonna get inside the shock and make it even better. So our spring kits are, uh, Eibach might be three spring kits, soft, medium, and hard, that's your choice. And you don't get to choose whether the front is stiffer than the rear. Um, with our spring kits, we modify them according to what you have front different than the rear, different, the rear different than the front. Um, we, we probably have 30 different spring kits for one UTV, depending on what you have for accessories and how you drive and where everybody's sitting and where all your accessories are, are, in the, are at in the UTV. So um, uh, choices, more availability, way more uh, tunability in spring kits typically is what the difference is between what we do and a lot of people do. Also, when you get inside the shock, then our spring kit's going to work for the best possible valving options inside the shock when you get there, too. Ryan Peacock's in the building, mm. and Rusty Demon would like to say, Mitch, Brooke loves her new straps, say it up. Thank you. You're welcome, man. Glad she loves it. <clears throat> awesome. So uh, next thing on the list. So valving is always going to compensate for spring rate changes. Um, as long as we keep our spring kits in the safe range for your weight, then a lot of our valving will work, even if we change the spring rates by 50 pounds one way or the, or the other. But typically, if we're gonna change more than that, then we're gonna change valving too. And that is where we shine, where we are doing internal work to um, tune that shock for your driving style and that spring kit that is tuning for your weight and your driving style. All of those things have to come together to work correctly. So valving is always very important when you start changing springs. Coil bind, we talked about that with height. Really the only issue with height changes is going to be a bind possibility. Same springs on different cars and adjustability and weight. So we can take two different UTVs that might be both say Can-Am X3s and one weighs more than the other and we might send those two different people the same spring kit. The reason is um, one might have 150 pounds more weight, which is not enough to justify more spring rate compared to the other X3. Also, we take their driving style into consideration. So maybe the heavier car, that person drives slower or is more trail. And the lighter car might be a more aggressive driver. So for the aggressive driver, we're going to run one spring kit. And on the heavy car, we run the same spring kit knowing they're going to drive slower so it's more plush. So we take many things into consideration when we do those spring kits. Mitch? Triple digit sketch, do you change spring rate depending on the race? Um, no. No. Um, we don't change spring rates uh, depending on the race. Um, we're tuning race cars for the most aggressive driving possible and the biggest whoops and jumps and washouts possible. Um, if the race doesn't have big whoops and, and washouts that might require a ton of spring and valving for it, then typically it's a flat graded race like um, Vegas Torino where it's all drifting. And if it's all drifting, then you're going to want the thing on the stiff side, no body roll, so you can actually be quick in the corner too. So spring rates typically aren't going to change. Sometimes we, we change valving. Um, we might go a little bit less aggressive, but usually it's like way on the aggressive side of things compared to most people. Steve. Justin, is it hard to figure out spring rates when you have a very heavy driver? Hmm. Yeah. I, it can I, be. I mean, it it, can't, how, so heavy, how heavy what, is the what driver? What do you do, Steve? Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, why don't you tell everybody what we do here in the shop? 
Uh, so we, we have weight and sandbags and dumbbells and stuff like that. So I mean, depending on how heavy the driver is, uh, I mean, I'm 207 pounds on a good day. I don't know. <laughs> I tell the truth. <laughs> oh yeah. Not, yeah, maybe 17. That's, uh, I'm, I'm like 210 pounds, and I mean, if we have a 285-pound driver or a 300-pound driver, we throw dumbbells in, or we get one of the bigger guys and throw less weight in, but we, we use we use weight sandbags. You like duplicate that, that driver's I weight. I duplicate the weight. Now, in the event that I only have the shocks here and I don't have the car, uh, we try and use the mentality of when we had a car here, use that same mentality on how You take it. the notes from previous cars we've done here in the shop. Mm -hmm with the exact weight that that person has thrown in there. And, you know, doing 15 cars a day, that means we have thousands of car notes. And you can go back and look at them at any moment in time on your iPad, yep. right? In real time. In real time. How, tell people how you do that. Uh, I can go back in my iPad and I can look at any specific customer, any specific car mm -hmm. need be. Um, so if I have, we'll say, a 300-pound driver and a 300-pound driver and the car is kind of similar, will the spring kit be similar? It can be, but I can use those notes to go back and help me uh, for the process and get you the right spring kit for that car. So because we do so many in person, either in the dunes or here at the shop, that knowledge uh, extends forward to the shocks that come in. Uh, in the mail when we don't have the vehicle to set ride heights to try and yep. get it close. Yep. So you'll go back to say that preload and that and that spring um, rate and kind of duplicate that knowing that you're really close. Yeah, I can, yeah. for sure. All right, Mitch, you got one? Uh, off topic a little bit, but Brad True Love, do shock modifications on smart shocks equipped vehicles require computer updating? No, no. absolutely not. Smart shock uh, internal work does not affect any of the programming. Steve. Justin, when we do just a spring kit, so for like the X3 specifically is this mm -hmm. question, do we have a certain tune we put on a stock spring kit? Um, so, I mean, the short version is yes. We, what we do is we have internal valving, tube locations, um, porting, and other mods that we have as a baseline starting point. And then what we'll do is take your driving style, if you're more aggressive, and we will run that internals stiffer and uh, maybe more plush in certain areas so that it still rides amazing. And if you're less aggressive, then we'll modify the internals there too. Typically springs are tuning weight and internals are tuning driving style. That's very oversimplified, but that's an easy way to think of it, Steve. So I think the question was more of, so when we do our valving and springs, we put like an adjustment in the actual shock. When we send out just a spring kit, we typically don't necessarily put an adjustment into that shock. Just spring kit. Correct. No valving. So yep. we don't necessarily have a base setting for that. We can. We oh, can base you set. Out. You mean base setting in the adjusters? Correct. That's. Oh. I asked the question. I guess wrong. But the, I basically, you. they're asking just spring kit. Do we have an adjustment we put in? No, but we can help you. You know, you tell me your style of riding and what you're doing. I can help you further. Your yeah, adjustment. and and you know the reason for that is we we prefer that you start on the soft side of everything, so it's really really plush and it might bottom out a little easy and then you sneak up on the compression adjusters and you start stiffening them a little at a time it stops bottoming and eventually it, it gets right in the range where you drive and like to feel it um, that's the easiest way we find is to sneak up on those adjustments starting soft and working your way up stiff if you start stiff you just don't know how soft it needs to be um, and I, I feel like a lot of people have a, a harder time going from way too stiff and softening it than they do starting soft and, and stiffening that. And it just makes Chase happy when I talk about soft and it stiff. It really does. It does. I would yeah. like to say, Allie Ale says shock therapy made the suspension so much better for her kids. Awesome. As that well, is awesome. As well as A1 EX 5.7 shock therapy FTW for the wise. Right, Mitchy boy? Yes, sir. And what mm. about this old myth? Is it true that shock fluid is just mineral oil? Um, no, I mean, in the past, in the past, then yeah, that might have been the case. But, but today, um, shock oil is basically hydraulic oil. And there's lots of grades of hydraulic oil. And, and, and even construction equipment with hydraulic cylinders on a backhoe, that hydraulic oil will work in a shock. It may not be the best grade of hydraulic oil, and it might degrade with temperature and over a race. So now you start to see hydraulic oils um, be developed for really high temps, like three, four, five hundred degrees, and um, different viscosities that you can tune with. It's also a, a tuning option for what we do. Um, but to say mineral oil would be like uh, I don't know. It's a hard, hard comparison. It's like saying a car with you know maybe wagon wheels is just as good as the stuff today with 
you know, 20s in a Z-rated tire. It's just not. I mean, the technology is much better and the, and the material and the oil is much better too. There's a ton of questions about how often to change your shock oil. Um, El Diablo said, how often do you change the spring fluid? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, is that close to blinker fluid, which is probably in the manual. Check the manual on that one. Shock oil, um, if you have stock factory oil, then I would suggest doing that 1,000 miles to 1,500 miles. But if we've seen the shock and we've got our oil in it, then you're looking at 3,500 miles, probably something like that. If you're racing, then we, no matter what, it's 1,000 miles um, plus. So you could run a thousand mile race without having, to, uh, without having to worry about it. Mr. Sparkles, I saw your question earlier. He wants to know what do we do with the takeoff springs? Um, we've built some cool stuff out of some of them, but for the majority. Bar stools, um, spring yeah. men. Uh, cup holders, like somebody said. Wine single, holders. Single spring rate for Chase to sit on. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Oh, what? Tell my secrets. <laughs> uh, but honestly, they mostly get recycled. Yeah, they get returned to the customer if they are asked to have them back, um, but otherwise they get recycled, right? Unless everybody's got a wild hair for art, yeah, for I mean, mobile art. Yeah. Okay, back to the board. So, same springs could be on different cars because they are adjustable. You can run the preload up and down, and also somebody might drive less aggressive, and somebody might, might, might drive more aggressive, and sometimes you find the sp same spring kit can work for both. Typically, spring kits are tuned to weight, where you have it on the UTV, um, how much you have on it, and in some ways, how aggressive you are. Upper first, so what this is, here's the order in which you should change springs according to weight. Upper spring first, lower spring last, valving to compensate. So back to the numbers that we originally started this whole thing with. It's a lot easier to change an upper spring and keep the lower spring alone and see a linear change in spring rate that's going to help you with the weight on the UTV. Remember, these changes are in inches. So. 222 pounds an inch versus 250 pounds an inch. So that's 28 pounds difference per inch. That's also per shock. So 28 pounds an inch times two rears, then that's gonna give you almost 60 pounds of um, spring rate advantage, or it's going to uh, overcome 60 pounds of weight you've added to the vehicle if it was sitting right on the axle. So if that weight was sitting in the middle of the vehicle, it might be 150 pounds of weight that that would overcome. If it's sitting behind it on the bumper, it may not be enough for uh, 60 pounds. So again, back to math, um, you can play with the calculator all you want. It's not gonna get you very close. What actually gets you perfect is testing this stuff and doing it day in, day out. Once you've passed upper spring changes and those are not enough to account for the weight, then and only then are we going to change a lower spring. The reason that we try not to change lowers very often is because when the dual rate system compresses far enough and you get into the crossover ring and that upper spring no longer works and you're on the lower spring, it is hard to control that from a rebound standpoint. It's a lot of force pushing the system apart. So when you run the lower spring up in rate, it's two to three times more effective on the vehicle or against the shock rebound valving. So eventually when you start running lowers up too high, it creates bucking and you have to address it with shock valving to fix it. Um, it is a lot easier to manipulate the combined rate by changing the upper. It's a lot more accurate to do it that way and you don't have to modify the rebound valving so much when you do it that way. Um, but when we know something's gonna be heavy or aggressive, then we're changing valving to accommodate that spring change, even if it is a lower spring, no matter what. That's part of the custom in what we do for spring kits. Steve. Justin, if someone is getting uh, valving done, do we replace shock oil or nitrogen in the shock, or is that only by request? Um, so it's different for everything, depending on the use. Um, nitrogen is always replaced, no matter what. Shock oil can be replaced, um, most of the time it is. Um, I'm not even sure the instances where we're, we're going back and forth. It also depends on the shock. Typically, if it's a walker, we're changing the oil no matter what. Yeah. If it's a new, fox, then the it? fox oil is much better and you can run what's there, especially if it's brand new. But if it's even a question, we change it yep. no matter what. Uh, Mitch? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm gonna butcher that. Uh, M. Galivo, what's the next best thing to get after getting a spring kit? I mean, you kind of already went over that, so I would say valving. Valving no matter what. <laughs> Boom. 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 
Boom. Yep, that's kind of it. If you know, spring kits change according to all the weights. Valving uh, compensates the spring kit, or I would say a better word would be complements a spring kit specifically. specifically. Steve. Pick me, pick me. Mm. Justin, this person has asked this mm. question quite a few times. It really has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but mm. new commander or the R-Max? Which one? Mitch. The reason I say Mitch is because he's got more seat time in both of them than me. Dude, I really like the R-Max. Yeah. That thing was pretty sweet. Um, I don't really have a lot of time in the commander though, so it's kind of a tricky one. But I do have some time in the R-Max, and as of right now, I choose the R-Max. Over the two. So yep. when you get more time in a commander, then I'll you might you have some, you some might have more advice. But yeah. at this moment, R Max spring kit on the R Max is probably one of the best cars I've driven with just a spring kit on it. It was insane. One of the biggest changes. Yes. So it went from horrible to amazing just in a spring kit. Yeah, it was like valving and springing a totally other car with just a spring kit on that. Huge change. Yeah. So awesome. If you guys R -Max have an R Max, really that's a like and like a home run Yamaha, on an Chase. accessory. That's that a is Yamaha, Yamaha, dude. That's right. Come on, get more time on it, Mitchie. We do like Yamahas. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of questions that keep coming up, Stevo714. Too bad Matt wasn't here to answer this one. He has a lot of experience in, in this. Is it good to leave your car on jack stands during the off season? Uh, yeah, the only I thing you're sure. helping, the only thing you're saving there is, um, you know, maybe flat spotting a tire. That's it. Yeah. Springs don't care. That's a, also a very, it's a wives tale about, you know, having a car tied down. Is it going to hurt the spring? No. It is not going to hurt the spring. Only way that hurts the spring is if it's the cheapest spring ever made. I don't even know one today that would qualify for that. What do you think a spring does? Think of it this way. Compresses and extends its whole life. Maybe 50 times a second sometimes so it does not so the spring's getting a vacation by getting tied down in a in a in a trailer i wouldn't worry about that at all steve uh this might be a question for old mitchy over here when will you offer limit straps for the krx i think we've already answered we've that. covered that 10 times I'll it's a custom it, yeah. bracket yeah, it's, a, it's a new clamp design we, we're, we're still designing the clamp for it because it's so tight up in the top of the shock area we can't fit our normal clamp so as soon as that clamp is made we will have a limit strap kit Boom. for it i promise there it is last thing on the list behind me chase what is the last thing sir <laughs> america right usa and that <laughs> was the reason for that being the last thing on this list is because all of our springs are made in America. They are, la they are warrantied for life. If you ever have a, a problem with one, then it's a free replacement. Um, best materials, best processes possible in making that spring, and the highest QC list of things of any spring manufacturer. Um, ours are the straightest. Ours have the least amount of bow in all of the criteria that we place forward in our manufacturers to build the best spring possible and warranty it for life. How many springs have we ever replaced? Can you even think, like in the last five years, how many springs have broken that we replaced? To be honest, I would probably say like four or five. Ever. Ever. I'd say maybe enough to count on one hand. Yeah. Ever. 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 Yeah, and, and some of those might might have been other issues, but it does not matter. Yeah. It's a freebie. Um, our springs are so high quality, we just don't see the, the, the need to worry about it. It's not going to be an issue. They don't break. Uh, Nate Birch, I don't see the springs for the R-Max on your website. You are right. We're still waiting for the crossovers to be made. Once we have the crossovers, we already have the video done, right, Why don't you Josh? explain? Explain? Josh, Josh you want to <laughs> talk? No. Behind the camera? No. No. <laughs> No, no. Okay. Uh, we do have the video done. Uh, installation video, I should say. Um, but yeah, once Explain we, why the crossover is different. So Fox did a bigger body on that car. It is a 2.0 shock, but it is actually a 2.05 or 0.56 so or something like that. The normal crossover we have for 2.0 shocks does not fit on that on that specific shock specifically. Specifically. So a new crossover has to be made. Once that's made, we'll have everything for it, and it'll be up on the site. So. Awesome, Steve. Justin, how often do crossovers have to be replaced? This person had one ride and one of the rear crossovers is worn pretty bad. So uh, when you say pretty bad, that is a very relative term. All crossovers will rub. That is definitely a guarantee. Um, but did it rub through the crossover all the way to the threads? Doubtful. More than likely, a crossover will take, uh, I guess, a set. So it's going to rub on one side. It's going to rub 
you know, uh, 32nd of an inch. It's going to rub the, the, the outside shell, shell off of it. It might rub some of the engraved lines on it off of it, and that's it, and then it'll stop. Crossover rub has to do with spring bowing, which is spring clocking. Make sure you have the, the springs clocked according to our instructions, where the ends of the spring are not touching each other, but the ends are on the opposite sides of each other on the divider. That will straighten the spring package out. Also, if they're walkers, the walker plastic divider is very loose and allows it to tip side to side, which bows the spring and rubs the crossover more. Mm -hmm. So you can get a better divider, which we offer, and that's a little tighter clearance and it straightens the spring package out. More than likely, run the piss out of it. It's probably gonna rub like it did the first trip, and then that's about it. It's gonna be that way forever. Uh, Robbie Fraser actually had a pretty good question here. What's the weight difference between a stock cage and an aftermarket cage? Would that change what spring kit you would offer for the car? Yes. So stock cage is the lightest thing you're going to find. We've seen um, a lot of aftermarket cages that are 60 to 80 pounds heavier, and we've seen cages that are 160 pounds heavier. Um, typically, an uh, aftermarket cage isn't going to, uh, one manufacturer of cage versus another is not going to change our spring kit because you're well under the 250 pound range that we typically tune for because you might have one that's 60 pounds over, 160 pounds over, that's a 100 pound range. We're already throwing spring kit numbers at it that are taking into account a cage on an average weight number. Um, but you start throwing luggage rack on that or a bunch of light bars or a stereo up in that cage, we're going to change it. I had a couple questions about this just popped up and I was thinking about when purchasing your spring kit for RC2s, do you guys provide a sheet of compression and rebound settings for different terrain? Uh, not typically. We just tell you where, how to go through the process of adjusting it from all the way soft to, to right where you want it to be. Um, and then you will figure out what you like when it's trail versus high speed desert or dunes. Uh, usually you're just running the compression up for faster speeds. So trail is going to be the softest. You know, high-speed desert's going to be in the middle, and dunes are going to have a lot more compression put into it, and that's about the only thing you're going to adjust. Rich Fortin. Oh, did you have a question, Steve? Nope. No? Okay. Paralyzing 9 in. Justin, I can't talk, man. He, I think he's, he's gotten those shots going on the other end here. He's too, he's too <laughs> soft? Good. Yep. All right. I, I love it. Thanks for interrupting, Thanks, Mitch. Thanks, <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, was that who you were going to talk to? Yeah. Talk about? Oh. No, yeah, it was. He stole sure. him from you. No, uh, Rich Ford, can Justin explain why the industry uses dual rate springs instead of the progressive rate coils like the early UTVs? Okay, because progressive rate coils are very expensive to manufacture, and typically they have you can't control or adjust when the rates come in. So uh, it might be less expensive for a manufacturer to do a um, progressive rate coil because it's one spring that costs a little more versus two springs that cost a lot more, but uh, you can't tune it. So uh, whatever they have in there for progressive rate is what you get, and when that rate comes in is what you get. With a dual rate system, you can adjust the crossover and you can adjust a ton more. So a dual rate system works better than any progressive rate spring. If you see a progressive rate spring, that's probably the factory trying to save some money and you have no adjustability. Would nitrogen PSI affect springs? Nitrogen PSI does not affect spring in any way. What nitrogen does is it, it, it is pressurizing the oil inside the shock, which more nitrogen will extend the shock shaft out of the body and raise your ride height slightly, but you're only talking about half an inch to an inch max. And um, if that, I mean, you're really talking, if you change the nitrogen from 150 pounds to 400 PSI, would you get an inch difference in ride height? It doesn't change the spring, though. It might change ride height. What nitrogen will do is if you overpressurize the shock, you will have a stiffer ride quality through chop and chatter. If you underpressurize the shock, then it can bottom out really easy. It will, um, it will uh, cavitate the oil, which tends to be noisy. Sometimes you can hear that. If you don't wear a helmet in a, in a UTV, you can hear the shock actually going really quickly behind you, and that's actually cavitating oil, and it's a problem. We see that in a lot of um, valving packages from other shock guys where they over-valve the rebound and cavitate the shock. Um, it's not good, and it overheats things, and it doesn't work well. So nitrogen pressure, you're not going to gain anything by going too much. You're, not gonna, you're gonna lose a lot by going too little, so keep it in the happy medium and your best right there. 
BLK Doug says, so I bought a 21 XRS RR and paid to have shock therapy spring kit installed, mm -hmm. added, but I wasn't asked about weight or about my driving style. Okay, so that was probably a dealer. Dealer, yeah. yeah. Not so, from us. Yeah. Maybe it wasn't purchased from us, so I don't know. Um, so that means that the dealer that you got that from didn't ask you the questions that we require on the fill out sheet, the customer detail sheet for spring kits. Maybe because they knew what you were doing because they supplied the car. They're like, hey, it's stock plus this and this and they just did the sheet for you. Um, more than likely that's the case, especially if it was a dealer brand new. Uh, a, lot of, <clears throat> a lot of nitrogen questions. It's really kind of weird. What's I mean, the common it, PSI guys run for walkers? Uh, on one, 200. 150 to 200. Yep. Yeah. Um, here's, here's, the nit here's the nitrogen deal. Nitrogen prevents, um, um, nitrogen prevents, I just lost the word, not hydraulicking, but, um, cavitation. cavitation, sorry, thank you very much, duh, on the end. nitrogen prevents oil cavitation, when you shove a piston through that oil and it's not pressurized, you can separate the oil molecules and then the shock doesn't dampen anything, if you pressurize that oil with 150 to 200 pounds of nitrogen, then that oil is under three to four atmospheres of pressure or three to four times the pressure we see right here talking to you. When you do that, then it's harder to separate the molecules and you don't have cavitation. So then the shock can actually work when the piston moves faster, bigger hits, bigger jumps. So that's the job of nitrogen. When you run it too low, then the system cavitates and it will bottom out and get noisy if you don't wear a helmet. If you run it too high, then it gets really stiff in the chop and chatter because it's actually pressurizing the shaft and not pressurizing the oil as much as you want. So there's a happy medium, don't bother. And when people say tune your shock with nitrogen, that is ridiculous. They don't know what they're talking about. 150 to 200 pounds pretty much covers anything and then you start changing valving in the spring after that. Idiots. There it is, Steve. You, sa you said it. And I mean specifically. It's very specific. It is. Imbeciles. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very classy. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, if you guys, you guys got one more minute for questions, otherwise we're out of here. I'm going to recap. There was kind of an off question here. Justin, what hair product are you using in your hair? Um, I use water. Like, I get out of the shower. I literally get out of the shower and I go like this and I go to work. He's gorgeous. As well as That's he's it. gorgeous. And we'll go to this after. We have a lot of people wanting to see. They're either wanting me to light Damien's KRX on fire, or they're saying it is fire. <laughs> What's up with Damien's it's, KRX? It is a pretty nice KRX. Got a lot of cool stuff on it. Looks nice, don't you think? Josh, what nice did cake. we just do with this car? Uh, we put front and rear links on this. Put car. Josh on camera so he won't talk. Tell the world, Josh. Go ahead. I mean talk. I'm just kidding about the fact you don't we talk. We put front and rear links on this car. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear his, we, we yeah. put front his voice? His voice. <laughs> I think he's actually really nervous when the camera comes on him. It's so cool because he loves shining the camera on everybody else. I like it. Um, so to recap, spring kit tuning. First, once you know the rates, you can start changing uppers and lowers to get the rate you want. Highly recommended you don't change lowers on a regular basis. Uppers are better to do. Preload gives you the adjustability, so one spring kit can cover multiple cars. Height of the spring doesn't typically do anything other than put a preload nut in a different spot on the shock. Valving always is compensating or controlling a spring kit. So however you change a spring kit, you're probably changing the valving to control it. Coil bind is the only thing you try not to do, especially when you start changing spring kit heights and you go too short, you might get coil bind. Same springs on different cars, adjustable for weight. You can run the same spring kit on different weight vehicles because you have preload to adjust it. And depending on your driving style, the spring, same spring kit might fit both. On upper spring kit, upper springs should be changed first, lowers last so you don't have rebound issues. Valving is always going to compensate or control the spring kits. Last, all of our spring kits are made, all our spring kits are here. All our springs are made in America, no matter what, and lifetime warranty. Yes, Steve. Justin, how many springs do you think we have here? Didn't we say in the last video, did you say like about a million? Uh, yeah, um, so I misspoke. Okay. Actually, so I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry that we were wrong on a million springs. It was actually 
1,175,000 springs. I said 1.2. You did say 1.2, so good job, Steve. Thank you. There you go. Uh, Mitch. Oh, uh, let's see. Specifically, this is from Rich Fortin. Oh, no. What deodorant does Chase wear? The answer is none. <laughs> none. 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 Trick question. Uh, or whatever Every he... Joke's question. on us, because he doesn't wear it. <laughs> or, or the other answer is not enough. Not enough. Yeah. One of the, one one, of the two. One yeah. of the two. So, you guys, thank you very much for tuning in for Tech Tuesday, going over springs. Um, actually, if you look up upstairs, there's Ernie digging through a box of springs right now, probably creating some funky spring kit that's never existed for a brand new vehicle <laughs> and, and, and getting a headache at the same time. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, Chase, let's, uh, let's get on out of here. You guys don't have any more questions. We'll get back to our week. PR, and we'll, PRP seat said favorite seat company, question mark. Uh, my favorite uh, seat company is PRP seats. Yes, I'm sure you could have guessed that one, <laughs> but that's a very shameless plug by wow, PRP, good, PRP, but I will take that one and I will hit it out of the park. <laughs> Justin does PRP, best seats ever. Justin doesn't sit down, but when he does, it's on a PRP seat. That's actually a good tagline. PRP, or, you know, that one's free. You can have it. <laughs> Steve, send us out of here, bud. I'll tell you what, I'll give them this too. If you're looking to buy PRP seats, go to PRP.com. <laughs> or if you're looking to buy anything off our website, go to www.shocktherapist.com or call into the shop at 623-217-4959. I could sell that shit. <laughs> 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 ah, damn.